Welcome to everyone. We apologize to, to start a little bit late. late uh, this is due to a technical prog problem. Uh, so welcome to the webinar on the protection of civilians in Gaza, environmental injustice and human rights abuse, organized by the Geneva Water Hub, the special procedure branch yeah, pro uh... of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights and PACS. My name is Mara Tignino, and I'm senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law and, Glo and the Global Studies Institute of the, Geneva, of, of the University of Geneva and lead legal specialist at the Geneva Water Hub. The topic of this webinar is crucial for the application of international law to a situation of armed conflict. Two of the fundamental principles of international humanitarian law are at stake in the armed conflict in Gaza, namely the principle of distinction, which provides that parties to an armed conflict must at all times distinguish between the civilian population and combatants and between civilian and between civilian objects and military objectives. The combatants shall direct their operations only against the military objectives. This implies that indiscriminate attacks and the use of indiscriminate means and methods of warfare are prohibited. We will get back to this point during the presentations. The principle of proportionality is a corollary of the principle of distinction. It recognizes that in the conduct of hostilities, causing incidental harm to civilians and civilian objects is sometimes unavoid unavoidable. However, the principle of pr proportionality places a limit on the extent of civilian harm that is permissible when military objectives are attacked. The principle of pr proportionality must be used to balance the principles of humanity and military necessity. Before, before going to the presentations, I would like to stress the importance of the principle of humanity in the conduct of hostilities. Jean, Jean Pictet, the architect of the modern fundamental principles of the Red Cross and the Red Cross movement, referred to humanity as the essential principle from which all other principles of international humanitarian law derived including the principle of military necessity. As uh, some scholars noted, humanity implies uh, the respect of uh, human dignity and by extension, the respect of the human right to life. Although the principle of humanity is most often linked to humanitarian assistance, it must also guide the conduct of hostilities. Humanity denotes the un universality of human beings. We, as humans, are the same. Beyond international humanitarian law, human rights law and other fields of international law, such as environmental and water law, are also applicable during armed conflict. Today, we will hear about the human rights abuse of the rights to water and sanitation by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Water and Sanitation, Professor Pedro Arrojo Ajuto, and this presentation will be followed by an intervention of Ms. Marie Schellens, Environmental Security Analyst at Pax, who will share the current environmental crisis in Gaza. And finally, Professor Mark Zeitun, General Director of the Geneva Water Hub, who will bring his technical and political expertise to examine the limits of international law in protecting the civilians in Gaza. I apol apologize for the absence of two speakers, uh, Ms. Albanese and uh, uh, Mr. Raji uh, Suani, for the, their absence due to other uh, commitments. Also, uh, as a moderator, I plan to give to each uh, of the presenters 10 minutes, uh, and then I will take the questions from the public. Please note that the web webinar will be recorded, and uh, uh, it will end uh, so, uh, sometime before 4.30. So let me give now the floor to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Water and Sanitation, Professor Pedro Arrojo Agudo.
So the floor is yours, Pedro. Uh, thank you very much, Mara. Uh, first doubt, excuse me, uh, can I intervene in French? Is it in, in English? If not, tell me. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, as, you, as you wish, Pedro, we planned in English. Uh, preferably uh, English better? Yes. Please. Okay, no problem. Well, when we talk about uh, environment in um, in the in Gaza Strip, um, there is something essential and very closely related with the people who can live or who lives uh, live in in the area in the Strip uh, is of course the way of uh, having uh, renewable water resources. The only natural uh, water resources that exist in Gaza uh, is the coastal aquifer shared with Israel, by the way. Um, but this aquifer uh, has uh, 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 the, the, the amount of water for renewal, uh, renewing the, the, the water, the, the, the feeding, the, the aquifer is around uh, 80 hectometer, cubic hectometers per year. Uh, and is less and less with climate change. Uh, the problem is that even before the war, uh, during the last uh, 16 years, uh, under the blockade uh, uh, that have been uh, in force, um, the amount of water that the people in Gaza needed uh, has forced to pump uh, around 200 cubic hectometers, not just for drinking water, but also for the, you know, the, the small agriculture they have. Uh, so that means that is three times more than the uh, amount of water that could be extracted in a sustainable way. So the, uh, the, the consequence is very clear, is a massive salinization of the aquifer um, with other problems then uh, also with the uh, uh, pollution, uh, with um, uh, fecal pollution because of uh, deficient uh, sanitation systems with many problems for building uh, the plants for sanitation uh, because of most of 70% of the uh, of the resources needed the materials needed for building these plants are considered a double use and uh, are blocked in the, the border uh, so that means that most of most of the of, of the um, sewage water the, the, the wastewater uh, is not as uh, treated and contaminate during this time as contaminated the aquifer. But from a basic question is salinization. So uh, with the war, of course, uh, uh, all the, um, uh, the, the, the problem is aggravated and talking or thinking on environmental issues, for me, the main, one of the main elements, uh, looking at the future, even after the war, thinking on the peace for the future, um, is the, the, the measure and the plan uh, from the Israel army of uh, flooding the, the tunnels with, uh, uh, with seawater. Um, under this measure, uh, you can imagine the salinization of the aquifer will be uh, more, very, very grave, must accelerate the, aqu the aquifer salinization and uh, uh, aggravate this uh, this question this element for the future uh, for me is imagine the the, the ancient the, the old way of uh, treating the enemies after defeating them uh, with you know this measure of uh, uh, sowing the territory the enemy of the enemies with salt in order uh, to avoid any kind of life for the future so in this sense, uh, saline, saline, uh, making, uh, accelerating the salinization of the aquifer, we are uh, avoiding the only, the, the preventing the possibility of uh, of using the only uh, source of drinking water of uh, um, um, water in the area for the people that can live in the future. So for me, this is an environmental impact. Uh, but with a disaster, uh, disaster, uh, disaster as consequence for the future, for the population, for the future in in the area, is uh, something that point uh, to the uh, uh, to, to to the this kind of uh, um, uh, human uh, 
the, the, if you if you see the seventh um, the article seven of the Rome Statute is uh, the, um, the 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 question of extermination. No, uh, recognize when water, uh, food, mainly food, medicines are blocked for the civilian population. Well, when we talk about this in the future, we are uh, looking at the future in this way, avoiding the possibility of living with uh, the, the only source of uh, drinking water possible that we need to recover instead of making worse and worse. No, so this is for me the main, the main, one of the main uh, concerns for the future. And I think it is necessary to avoid this kind of uh, measure, military measure, but with environmental and social consequences very, very grave. Thank, thank you for uh, these uh, initial uh, thoughts uh, on the uh, on the on the question and uh, bringing uh, uh, together human rights and uh, yeah, environmental uh, issues. Uh, so now I, I give the uh, the floor uh, to the, uh, Marie uh, from Pax, who uh, will go more in detail to show the uh, the environmental impacts in uh, in Gaza due to the military uh, operation thank you the floor is yours marie thank you mara and thank you pedro do you hear me well yes and you see the uh, you see the screen right yes. uh wait you still see the screen right yes Okay, so I'm not a legal expert, first of all, uh, but my contribution in this webinar will rather be the research that we did on the environmental impacts of the war in Gaza uh, up to the end of December, because then we published this report on the kind of reverberating uh, impacts on public health, but also on the environment in the war in Gaza. And it's really just a snapshot, an idea of what we, what is happening there on the environmental front. Uh, as far as we can know from from the outside, um, but it is important to raise those issues, to raise uh, to raise those problems that the people are dealing with in the Gaza Strip. Um, first of all, to note, which is also something that Pedro already noted before, is that before uh, the October seventh uh, invasion of Gaza, of Gaza, there were already major natural resource uh, management challenges in a degraded environment in Gaza, and that was due to several factors. So that was due to the sixteen-year blockade already ongoing, also past military attacks, groundwater pollution because of a lack of sanitation of of wastewater mainly. Uh, salinization of aquifers, uh, like Peter also mentioned. Climate change, of course, is uh, impacting all of us already, and uh, low means uh, and low capacity to do any sort of environmental governance because there's just other uh, critical issues that need to be dealt with in a more urgent way often. So that was all already prior to... Um, to October 7th. Um, very shortly on how we did this research, what kind of information we used to actually uh, come to the results that we have. Uh, we use a lot of data, existing data from various researchers and organizations. So it comes from various universities, but also organize, also uh, UN organizations based in Gaza, for example, um, and everything they put uh, available open source. Uh, we also do visual analysis of open source satellite imagery, but also more statistical and machine learning analysis of, of those kinds of imagery. We use a lot of new social media video and pictures that are being posted online. And then we uh, inform ourselves as well through interviews with uh, water specialists and humanitarians working in Gaza, also with local partners from our organization. Um, and we bring that all together and try to verify which is actually what is actually happening there. What is the story? What are the impacts? What are, what are the issues? Um, and so uh, it has been very clear that there are very direct impacts on the water resources in Gaza. This picture, this picture already shows a, a very clear image of smoke rising over the Gaza industrial estate uh, with visible uh, damage on the water tower on the right. I can use my pointer, I think. So here you see a water tower with, with clear damage on it. Um, 
and that was on the 6th of December this picture was taken but more on a over, like what our research brought together is actually this whole um picture of of um of water infrastructure so we made a map of all the water infrastructure data that we could find so in blue you can find drinking water wells you can find in dark blue water network um infrastructure like pumps and water towers in orange you can find the uh, wastewater treatment plants and other pieces of the sewage network. In purple, you can find desalinization plants, so there's bigger ones, but there's also very small scale ones in Gaza. Uh, and in green, there's not so many. You can find some storm infrastructure like dams and locks. Uh, and then here on the coast, you have a couple of marine sewage outlets. Now in the red in the background, you can see all damaged buildings and you can see there's a lot here in Gaza City. By then there was damaged buildings up until the 29th of November. And uh, you can see that a lot of this infrastructure has been damaged with the buildings that they are actually in. Um, um, so in general, we have destruction of all of these types of, of water infrastructure that would lead to a good uh, water management cycle and a good good functioning wash uh, system. Um, I think I have a couple of pictures that exemplify that. So this is a picture of a, a crater that was formed through an Israeli airstrike that hit the main road between Khan Yunis and between Rafa. And you can see that actually some of the water pipes have been hit and are destroyed. Another example here is um, this water desalinization plant in the north of Gaza at the coast. Uh, this is a picture in January 2023. This picture is in November 2023. And you can clearly see some damage here on the side of the main building, but also all of the surrounding infrastructure has been damaged or even completely destroyed and is gone. Another example is this uh, wastewater treatment plant south of Gaza City. Uh, it's, a, it's a big plant. You can see here the water, uh, water filtration uh, installations and the water treatment installations. Uh, but the damage is mainly noted here on their solar panel field. So you see some craters that have destroyed the electricity infrastructure from this um, wastewater treatment plant, which makes that it's not functioning. So those are some of the very direct impacts that we have noticed and some some of the examples of of what is uh, what is happening in Gaza in the past months. Uh, of course, these kind of impacts on water infrastructure lead to direct health issues from shortage uh, shortage of access to uh, safe drinking water, uh, but also a lack of sanitation, which then leads to a spread of uh, diseases. Uh, on top of that, we have the collapse of the healthcare system, so that will lead to major, major issues. Um, but next to all of those direct impacts, we also have more indirect impacts on water and health and generally the environment in Gaza. Uh, this map gives you an overview of actually, again, the damaged infrastructure in red, but then it indicates also where there are some hazardous facilities that can be expected to release pollutants if they are damaged. So, for example, industrial infrastructure like warehouses of chemicals for pharmaceutical products or of plastic products, but also oil depots uh, and these kind of things. We have a couple of electricity, uh, electric power plants. Um, we have in orange also the refugee camps that are being destroyed actually with the, with the infrastructure. Uh, and important uh, as well is that there is a, a crisis in the waste management. So you can see on the map as well, there's a couple of um, formal waste sites, which are the gray dots, but may many, many more informal waste sites, which are the white dots. Uh, and they have just been growing excessively. There's no management of the waste anymore, which then eventually lead to even more health risks from these, from air pollution by burning waste, but also communicable, communicable diseases from, for example, rats in those places. Um, here you can see, for example, uh, a zoom in on the foam production facility, and here is a zoom in on the on the destroyed uh, warehouse for chemicals. Um, so you can just only imagine what happens if 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 you hit such targets uh, with large explosives. Uh, this is an example of a soda plant that was that was being destroyed. So before it looked like this, after it's completely destroyed, and these are the plumes that came from the. Uh, from the burning of the of the factory. Uh, another aspect is the damage to agricultural lands. Um, 
uh, our friend who is a professor at uh, Kent State University. He did an analysis of the damage to different types of, of crop plants. So in green, you have annual, no, in, in yellow, you have annual, annual crops. In green, you have orchards. And in red is those those two types of land use that have actually been destroyed by uh by the aggression of the of the Israeli uh, military forces. So for example, you have these two zooms in again, but I, but I made them a bit bigger here. We have destruction of, of greenhouses, which is um, much more difficult to see on the map because they're smaller, but they're very high, they're very high numbers of greenhouses and they're also economically very important. They, they ask for a large investment, but they also provide um, they provide higher uh, higher prices for their um, for the the cultivations that they grow there. So it is a very important uh, piece for for the livelihoods of Palestinians. So these have been massively destroyed. Um, here you can see on this image you can see some young orchards, some older orchards, and here you can see like a vehicle track of of a truck just going right through it and destroying it, but also craters um, in the in the fields. So uh, with that, we just want to show that the impact on, on land use can also not be uh, not be underestimated, and that um, in, uh, in in uh, as a consequence of that, that there will also be impacts for food security, of course, and livelihoods when we start thinking about uh, building back. So. In short, uh, the conclusions from our research was that the, there has been massive use of explosive weapons in populated areas and rural communities in Gaza. That's something everybody already know. And then next to the massive human suffering that comes with that, there's actually also very strong reverberating uh, environmental risks from, from those explosive weapons, which have uh, impacts on the short, the medium, and the long term. Uh, so both health impacts on the short term, for example, air pollution, but on the medium and long term also into the soil and into the, uh, into the groundwater. Uh, and by that, it's really jeopardizing the livelihoods and the ecosystems that the, the Palestinians depend on. Uh, we also have to mention that documenting these kind of issues are extremely important and there are a lot of new tools available, open source, that that, that can really help with document this and are driving decision making more and more. This will also help in strengthening the accountability of various actors within, within the conflict and within uh, yeah, certain events uh, of the armed conflict to um to to be to to hold people accountable for those actions actually, um, but of course those new tools also come with their limitations and there hasn't been a lot of thought or guidelines yet on how to use those uh, those techniques in a, in an ethical way to make sure they don't harm actually the victims even more uh, in those areas. What we think is important to happen now in the near term, of course, the most important thing is an immediate and permanent ceasefire, but. Uh, because we don't uh, expect that to happen anytime soon, given the current political situation, at least the actors, uh, in case there is no ceasefire, need to adhere to the Geneva list of principles on the protection of water and infrastructure. And that includes um, protection of uh, indispensable objects for human survival, such as drinking water installations and supplies, but also of humanitarian aid workers and relief personnel um that actually uh helps to provide water and sanitation services uh, and then second of all uh, there needs to be a stop of the use of heavy explosive weapons in the populated area in the gaza strip and this would uh would uh, agree with the 2022 political declaration on the protection of civilians from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas so this is really a quite new uh, political declaration that really needs to to show its worth uh, in, in 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 the current situation in Gaza. Uh, on the long term, we think it's very important to keep strengthening the international regime around protecting the environment in armed conflicts, and that is mainly to then also be able to protect civilians better, again in the short term, medium term, and long term. But also, we need to start thinking post conflict, building back better. Uh, and building back greener, so taking climate change considerations into reconstruction works, for example, for 
water provision and 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 dams uh, and storm water treatment but also um, invest in cleanup remediation and restoration of these heavily contaminated sites now for example but for that we first need a real full scale environmental analysis with a lot of data from on the on the ground and that was uh, all i had to say to summarize our report yeah, may, yeah many thanks uh, marie it, uh, it was a very uh, de de detailed uh, yeah, presentation just uh, as a as a as a lawyer, I would like to specify that the Geneva list of principles on the protection of water infrastructure is a, a soft law instrument. Uh, so uh, we uh, we did uh, know a, a collection of uh, 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 binding binding norms uh, and uh, also uh, including uh, some recommendation. And I would like maybe here to uh, to mention. Uh, one of the uh, recommendation it is not to include to uh, to to have a humanitarian ceasefire to allow uh, especially uh, water engineers uh, so that uh, they can do their uh, their work uh, in the uh, in the field and uh, helping uh, not to to repair uh, water water infrastructure so it is a uh, I think uh, can be a, a a way to reduce the the human suffering on the uh, on the ground. Uh, so uh, now I would like to to give the floor to uh, Professor Mark Zaitun, who is a Director General of the Geneva uh, Water Hub. So I give you the floor, Mark. Thank you, Mara. So I'm going to give you my perspective both as a water engineer and as the director general of the Geneva Water Hub. First, by offering theory that comes from each perspective nestled within law, or at least my uh, imperfect interpretations of law. Then we'll look at the evidence from Gaza and we'll conclude, uh, we'll include, we'll conclude that there is extreme weaponization of water going on, that international law has had so far no apparent effect that this sets a dangerous precedent for the future, that water can be weaponized and used as a tool in this way. I mean, we really don't want to normalize that last image that Marie showed us of young girls having to wait for water. And uh, that our options are clear, but limited. I mean, in the media, there's no option but to continue to lobby, to raise awareness, to stop the killing. And in the short term, uh, almost immediately continue to build the norms that will make this unacceptable everywhere else. So first of all, theory uh, about impact of armed conflict on water systems, uh, work that's been carried out with the International Committee of the Red Cross in Yemen, in Iraq, in Basra, in Syria, and in Gaza, prior to this uh, latest attack, shows a, a number of things. I mean, if you're if you're if you want to understand the impact of armed conflict on water systems, you have to understand that water systems are composed of people, hardware, like infrastructure, and consumables like chlorine or petrol for the for the repair vehicles. And all of these elements are interconnected. And the impact that Marie described can be on any of those components. And water systems, of course, are interconnected with other public systems, like energy especially. If there's no energy, there's no water. If there's no water, then there's the health systems are compromised because surgeons can't sterilize their equipment or maintain a hygienic uh, conditions for, for health. Uh, we also know that the impact from these other conflicts, we know that the impact, direct, indirect, and cumulative impact endures well beyond the blast zone and long after the dust has settled. And that's mainly because of, uh, you know, you can look at it in many ways, the trauma that children feel for years, the, the effect on people's livelihoods or on people's health and through disease. And here the link with water and wastewater is pretty clear. When water and sewage mix, there's a much, much, much higher chance of the spread of disease. And so that disease occurs well beyond the blast zone and long after the dust has settled. We also know that the longer the conflict goes on, the more foreseeable all of this impact is. And that's actually important because as uh, Mara was talking about, the rules of proportionality and precaution in attack, and the rules of war, international humanitarian law, 
says that targeters, combatants, have to consider you know, the military advantage of the indirect consequences, so the collateral damage. Um, they have to balance the military advantage against the collateral damage. And they also have to, it has to be, um, they have to take precautions to minimize that impact. So the more and interpretations of that clause of international humanitarian law says that when the, the impact has to be reasonably foreseeable. So you have to be able to foresee the impact if you're going to apply international humanitarian law. And what the engineers are showing at the ICRC and elsewhere is that a lot of this impact is actually foreseeable and therefore should be considered when targeting, if you're conducting your war or your, your combat, if the conduct of hostilities is to match the rules of war. So that's the theory about, from an engineer's perspective, the theory about using water for peace, which is in fact the Geneva Water Hub's mission, mission is that water is a vector for peace. It can be used for peace when it's shared equitably and it's spared from the ravages of armed conflict and sanctions and pollution. But even in the most hostile neighborhoods, there are plenty of examples of rivals and enemies still coordinating over water. Um, but of course, water can be and long has been used as a weapon of war. Leonardo da Vinci was talking about what drew up plans to divert the Arno River away from his enemies. The Belgians diverted and operated the weirs in the trenches of World War I against the invading Germans. Snipers in Beirut and Sarajevo and other places would just wait by uh, water collection points for women who would go and collect the water, risk their lives to go and collect the water, um, because the snipers knew that water is so essential that people would risk their lives to that point and hunt them like hungry gazelles, like thirsty gazelles in the words of Mahmoud Darwish, a poet who was living through 1982 in Beirut. Uh, and of course, water has been used in Russia, in, in Ukraine, in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, notably to stop advancing armies or to deprive one or the other side of water. So weaponization of water is not new. This is all the theory. How does this apply in Gaza? Well, as Pedro said, the aquifer was already in rough shape before the 7th of October. People were getting their drinking water from uh, bottled, bottled drinking water, mostly imported from Egypt, or desalination plants like the ones that Marie showed that have been damaged, or under the sink desalination plants. And they would get their domestic water, so water for washing and household use or for agriculture from wells. So when the water, when the electricity and trade routes are cut off, then there's little to no clean water available. And there's no sewage being treated. So all the sewage that's being produced is, is raw and it's untreated and it's somewhere around where people are living. And a lot of it will be percolating down into that aquifer which is in some places 100 meters of sand uh, below the surface. So it, uh, most certainly some or extreme amount of contamination of the aquifer from the untreated sewage. Uh, the standing sewage, uh, so the, when water and sewage mix, the conditions for the spread of disease are, are entirely predictable. Uh, we've had over a century of epidemiology, which shows this. And uh, so what we're already seeing, what the WHO is reporting from Gaza is dysentery and other types of diarrhea that spreads very quickly because of the microbes that are in the sewage, which can get into the drinking water or onto the food that people then ingest. And it's doubly quick, or maybe exponentially that much more quick and that much more dangerous, especially to toddlers, when you're malnourished or, and when, the, when you're in a crowded place, as in the shelters, especially in the south of Gaza right now. And dying by, I mean, diarrhea to some people might not sound so bad, but you have to realize that it's a real killer, especially for toddlers. And it's not a nice way to go. You're basically defecating 
yourself to death or dehydrating yourself. And it's a situation you really wouldn't wish on your enemies. But here we have it. On top of all this, now the, the IDF has confirmed that um, they have been started flooding some of the tunnels with salt water. And as Pedro mentioned, this is this is a real concern because assuming that the uh, the tunnels are not sealed perfectly, then a lot of that seawater will percolate into the sand and down into the aquifer and make that aquifer even more contaminated, salinated than it already is. And one way to look at this is that the conditions of life are being in part destroyed. And that, if you look at the UN Convention on Genocide, is one of the five components which, uh, in, which uh, make up the definition of genocide, um, where of course you have to prove the intent to destroy at least in, in whole or at least in part. You could also look at it from an ecocide perspective, and I know Pax has done that. Uh, and there's a, not, a lot of other ways you could look at the, you know, the deliberate um, infiltration of groundwater uh, with, with salty water. It's a, it's a level of weaponization of water that I haven't seen anywhere else in the world or, or even read about. So now to conclude, I think, well, you know, this is extremely well documented level of catastrophe, killing, ethnic cleansing, ecocide, whatever it is, it's extremely well docu documented, maybe the best ever. What role for international law? Well, a lot of these laws are clearly violated. Uh, you could say that law has had no effect whatsoever, even after 115 days. But neither of the demonstrations of you know, hundreds of thousands of people in dozens of cities around the globe, nor has the real-time coverage of the atrocities and this extremely detailed documentation, none of this has, has even apparently slowed down the killing. So law joins all the other efforts to prove uh, worthless as we speak and worthless over the last 115 days. So this throws up for us, for me, certainly, I think, and I think I'd like to hear from the rest of the people listening. Are we doing enough? Are the people whose careers are based on law and this kind of thing benefiting from the suffering of others? Can we just go on as usual saying these are violations documenting it or are there other other things to do other actions we must take there are other options of course you can get into political movements boycotts or imagining and creating the future any sort of nonviolent way to to uh, improve the situation towards a future that has equal opportunities for everybody and the weaponization of water here i think uh, more than a little bit concerned that it hasn't uh, garnered a reaction across the globe that it should get. Because the concern is that if this kind of use of water is, is normalized, then we'll use it, any army, any combatant will use it anywhere. It'll become perfectly acceptable. And we'll see a lot more of it. And... But I think the more important and immediate work is back in Gaza, the people who are suffering right now with the rains, cold, overcrowding, mal malnutrition, lack of clean water, dysentery, double down on all of our efforts on that front and do what we can, and what you can individually and collectively. Thanks for listening. Back over to you, Mara. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mark. Uh, so I... I, I um... I I think that you showed very well you know, how you know, the uh, the uh, weaponization of uh, water is uh, is increasingly and the uh, conflict in in Gaza is uh, really the, uh, the best example of uh, of uh, of this. Uh, so uh, you you have also uh, know, in, uh, indicated that the. Uh, the limits of international law, what we can do, should we just observe uh, the, 
the lack of respect of, of norms. So maybe you know I see that for the moment that there are no questions. So probably they will they will come later. But maybe I would like like to to ask to the to the special rapporteur on of the rights to water and sanitation. Since uh, no, I I know that uh, he's not a, a lawyer, but I would like uh, to to ask him how no the armed conflict in in Gaza impacts uh, its its work. How uh, how no from uh, from his perspective, uh, he, uh, the, the looking at what it, it is happening in uh, in Gaza, this impacts uh, his uh, his perce perception also of, of uh, his role uh, as special rapporteur. Well, I think uh, Mark uh, Saitung has summarized and explained very, very well. I fully agree with him. Of course, I, as you know, probably we are uh, asking for awareness and for attention of to uh, everyone uh, from time ago, from the beginning of the war. Most of the rapporteurs, most of the independent experts of the UN, we are uh, making the alert, uh, the alarm. On, on the danger, we are in the way of a genocide. Uh, but uh, from my point, um, I insist in one thing that is very, very clear, among others, uh, humanitarian laws and everything, you know, uh, Article 7 uh, of the Rome Statute, you know, uh, characterizing, uh, cutting off, the supply of food, medicine, and basic needs such as uh, drinking water uh, as a crime against humanity uh, under the profile of extermination. Uh, and in this case, we are talking about environment and impacts on the people while well, flooding the tunnels um, with seawater. It uh, comes into play with, the, with this crime with aggravated uh, future prospects for the population that must inhabit the territory after the war. It's not just in the war. And you have explained uh, all the situation with, uh, with salination, but also with, uh, with uh, fecal contamination. Um, that was at the beginning before the war, but now is absolutely a disaster. Uh, the other day I had the, the, the data from, from UNICEF, uh, more than 70,000 children with dairy per week. Can you imagine this without hospitals, without medical uh, health, uh, help and so on? That means we have a, a, a arm of destroying arm, uh, massive destroying arm, but silent, not visible, you know, the health of people, uh, not just not having uh, enough water, but having polluted water for, Weeks and weeks uh, under these conditions is is a, I am sure that at the end when we will uh, account on the number of victims uh, we will have a huge amount of mainly children uh, that has been affected by this weapon uh, that is not so visible as an, a bomb you know uh, but is is little is is equally little. Uh, a disaster that is not so visible, uh, but we need to uh, to pay, to put attention on this question. And for the future, after the war, we need to build peace. But how to build peace if the environment that allow to live in the area is even more uh, affected with this affection to the to the um, to the aquifer. Um, so, so is is very important, and we need to uh, ask for public attention on these issues. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, we have a question for Mark uh, from uh, Brian Perlman, uh, uh, who's uh, asking: uh, Can you compare and contrast the similarities and differences between water weaponization in Gaza and Ukraine? I mean, the short answer is no, because I don't know Ukraine at all. I've never even visited myself. Uh, I certainly haven't worked there uh, as I have in Gaza. But um, I don't know if Pax, Pax has done some really interesting work. So maybe Marie could say something about that. Uh, and I think at some point, 
you know, it would be interesting and, and useful to compare how water is used uh, in, in, in every conflict. I mean, what the, you know, the well known, what's well known in Ukraine is that, uh, of course, the destruction of the Kharkova Dam, uh, which created a flood, uh, dropped down the cooling, dropped down the water table to the co nuclear cooling plant, and also stopped water from going into the Crimea, the canal that takes water to Crimea, which itself, the canal itself had been bombed earlier. And you hear of bridges uh, being destroyed intentionally because rivers can be sort of natural barriers to land armies, that kind of stuff. So hearing myself say that, if I, you know, comparing and contrasting with Gaza, it's, it's, it's a different scale, it's a different sort of use and intention. It seems much more tactical in Ukraine, um, you know, military, towards military, clearer military objectives than in Gaza. That's that's about all I could hazard a guess at at this point. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Yeah. I can add a little bit to that if you want. Uh, we've had some reports pretty um, sector specific. So we've had one report on destruction of uh, electricity infrastructure in Ukraine and one on agro industry uh, in Ukraine. And so you can see that actually the same types of industry are being attacked, but indeed very targeted attacks also to those. Uh, the difference is indeed the scale. Ukraine is so much larger, so the pollution is much more um, diluted and spread out over large areas than in Gaza. In Gaza, everything just stays within Gaza and all the pollution will will, will stay stuck there. Um, uh, the You do have accumulation around the front line a lot, also from munition use and from explosives, uh, like heavy metals and and um fuels and so on from from explosive materials uh that are really um that are really accumulating around the, around the front line but for the rest it's much more spread out um than in gaza uh and then another difference is of course that the people can flee away from those areas in ukraine and they cannot in gaza um so that those would be the biggest differences i think but at the same time you will also have very long-term consequences there Thank you, Marie. Uh, we have a question, I think, for all of you uh, from uh, Professor uh, Daniela Adam de Jong, who is asking, uh, uh, so what can be you know, the role and function of international law looking beyond the sanction uh, and uh, et cetera? So uh, she's wondering uh, uh, wh whether the reporting ob obligation that the International Court of Justice imposed on, on Israel uh, in his uh, in its in, in indication for uh, a provisional measure, will be able to to play a, a role. Um, so, what what is your maybe we can uh, we can start with Pedro uh, for you uh, with for, with the special rapporteur on the human rights, water and sanitation. What what, what is your uh, um, view on uh, this reporting obligation that? Uh, International Court of Justice uh, uh, indicated uh, in its uh, report. We have made a reaction, collective reaction of the mandates, the experts after this uh, uh, the decision of the court at the present, uh, I think is a positive decision. Uh, under these strong pressures, I'm sure they are receiving, uh, um, they have decided something important. They recognize uh, the uh, concern that really the, 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 the way of the, the fact that we are in the way of a genocide this is very important and so and they are asking for stopping this they didn't dare something that I think it was necessary but I can understand perhaps pressures and so on they didn't decide to order the ceasefire but in fact but in fact when you recognize this and you uh ask and uh, demand the Israeli government uh, to prevent, to uh, avoid uh, at all costs uh, this genocide, what is the way to do it? It's very clear, we need a ceasefire. Uh, so I think in the future we will assist uh, bigger and bigger pressures uh, for the ceasefire as a necessity for accomplishing 
uh, for accomplishing this 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 uh, decision of the court. No, so for me, in this sense, is positive, not as itself, but also, uh, but in the profile of the future for the for the near future. Uh, but of, of course, we need we need to, to ask not just Israel, but all the countries that are supporting more or less, you know, uh, this this strategy of war. Uh, we need to pressure the pressure uh, of the public opinion uh, and the citizens for a urgent ceasefire and to open negotiations for dealing for uh, negotiating the real. Uh, the, the the very nature of the conflict, you know, uh, behind uh, and the begin we begin to talk clearly on the need of the two states uh, recognizing each, each other, of course, and of, of all the, the rest of things that are on the table, including deliver the hostage and so of course, of course, but to have this perspective of our uh, stability, peace. Uh, giving security to Israel, but at the same time justice for the people in in, in Palestine. And uh, I remember some uh, uh, authority in Israel time ago saying Israel will not have security if uh, Palestinians have no uh, hope and justice. This is the key issue, uh, but we need the ceasefire. Without this, we continue to fit, you know, this the perspective of feeding hate and violence in, the, in both sides, you know, uh, we need the ceasefire urgently. Thank, thank you, uh, Pedro. Uh, so we uh, um, uh, we uh, we have uh, yeah, a few comments, uh, questions. Uh, um, uh, so from uh, uh, Yusuf Badawi is, is uh, saying. Uh, uh, you know what is the role of solidarity and the global. Uh, a civil society. So, how the global civil society solidarity can play a role also in uh, uh, you know, increasing the political uh, willingness to to respect and ensure the respect of uh, of international law. And uh, also another question: It is uh, uh, so how. Uh, no, how no, how we 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 can use not these broad violations of of the right uh, uh, to uh, to water in in, in Palestine. So so we are talking, uh, you know, of course, uh, of 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 Gaza, no, but but also uh, in uh, in West Bank. Um, so no, I I think it is very important that also. Uh, Pedro mentioned that the special rapporteur of the human rights water sanitation mentioned this link between uh, uh, water and, and peace as a vehicle for, for, for peace. And so I think it's important that we should bring, uh, uh, we, 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 we should uh, uh, continue to, to, to believe also that, uh, that, that peace is possible and that water will be an element of, uh, uh, of this. Um, so uh, maybe I, 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 uh, we, we have also a, a comment uh, from uh, uh, Professor Selby, uh, who is uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, the, uh, the deaths from sanitation health impacts is crucial, and 70% uh, uh, of the excess de deaths during uh, the 23-25 war in, da in Darfur, for instance, uh, were disease from uh, from uh, and mal malnutrition. Um, so he's, uh, he's saying you know, that Gaza is different, of course, from uh, Darfur, but both uh, show you know, the long term impacts of sanitation health on mortality. Uh, so just you not know, to also to stress the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the link you know, between the lack of uh, water and sanitation uh, services on the on the right to uh, on the right to life and the right to uh, to health. Um, uh, so uh, there is a question uh, from uh, Mohammed Al uh, Al Maidi, who is uh, saying uh, uh, potential environmental impacts of damage solar system was reported. Do we have any report or idea? of the impact of damaged desalinization plants uh, other than loss of potential source of water. Um, so uh, 
I don't know if you have any information about uh, uh, the uh, the impact of uh, damage the desalinization plant. I don't have any specific knowledge about like what kind of installations there are, but it might be good to look in the feet, which is like a tool developed by um, by by Ocha. Is the I forget the abbreviation now. I think it's the fast environmental assessment tool, uh, which for a lot of different types of facilities, often industrial facilities, it lists what can be the health impacts of of kind of like destroying this specific um this specific uh facility so for example if you have a pharmaceutical warehouse you will probably get these and these and these kind of chemicals out um and then these are the health uh issues and risks that you need to deal with so it would be good to to maybe check the feed if desalinization plants are in there but i'm actually doubtful so maybe, maybe we could ask for an update from them uh to include that as well further i just think uh the the destruction of desalinization plants the main issue is that there's less uh there's just less potable water and sanitation water available it might also lead to less pumping of groundwater which then will lower the the kind of like desalinization of groundwater uh but it's for the wrong <laughs> for the wrong reason so so i wouldn't i wouldn't describe that as a beneficial effect yeah, so maybe at this point I would like to to close the the webinar, uh, since also the the special rapporteur is uh, is leaving. Uh, so I would like uh, to to thank you all uh, the uh, the speakers and also uh, the audience for for the question. And uh, uh, as uh, mentioned at the at the beginning, uh, this webinar has been uh, recorded, so we will uh, uh, share in uh, our uh, web page of the Geneva Water Hub. So again, uh, uh, many thanks uh, to all of you. Thank you to you. And congratulations, Mara, Mark. Really, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro, Marie, and Mara for hosting us so long. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.